class. This toolbox will now expand on the concept of functions that we discussed in the last toolbox and combine it with our previous toolboxes on matrices. We will discuss how to use functions to manipulate not just scalar values, but matrices, and see that this can be a powerful tool for exploring things like population dynamics. So far we've mostly talked about functions that take one or more scalar values and then return another scalar value. This is not, however, the only way that functions can work. For instance, some functions will take a scalar input and return a vector or a matrix. Other functions will take a matrix or vector input and return a scalar. And of course, some functions can take a vector or matrix input and return a vector or a matrix. Let's take this function here as an example. This function says that f of x is equal to the matrix x multiplied by the matrix 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Let's see how this would work. First off, since we know that when using matrix multiplication, the number of columns in the first matrix has to be equal to the number of rows in the second matrix, we know that this function will only work if x has exactly two columns. So let's define a matrix P that has two columns and the values 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1. We can envision this matrix as encoding positions in space. In this case, they actually make a right triangle. All right, now let's evaluate f of x. We know that from matrix multiplication that a 4 by 2 matrix multiplied by a 2 by 2 matrix will give us another 4 by 2 matrix. So we just need to calculate each of these elements. The first element will be equal to 2 times 1 plus 1 times 0 and hence it is equal to 2. Similarly, element 1, 2 will be equal to 2 times 0 plus 1 times negative 1. Element 2, 1 will be equal to 2 times 1 plus 2 times 0. We can finish the matrix multiplication out pretty easily, and we see that f of p is equal to 2, negative 1, 2, negative 2, 1, negative 2, and 2, negative 1. So if we look at these two matrices, we can see that basically our function f is essentially just multiplying the second column of our matrix, p, by negative 1. It's really just flipping the sign of the second column. And now if we graph the new matrix, we can see that graphically what it is doing is mirroring our triangle over the x-axis. That's actually really useful because it means that any time we want to mirror an image, all we have to do is apply this function. All right, let's take a look at an example that we might come across in terrestrial ecology. If scientists are trying to restore a grassland ecosystem, one of the main things that they might care about is, of course, the growth of the grass. Now, an individual grass plant can be in three potential stages. It, of course, starts as a seedling. If it survives the first seedling stage, it will grow into the vegetative adult stage. The vegetative adult stage is a stage of the grass in which it is building more of its own biomass, it's getting bigger, but is not producing seeds and further offspring. From the vegetative adult stage, it can transition into the generative adult stage. The generative adult stage is capable of producing new seeds, and it can either stay in the generative adult stage, or it can transition back into the vegetative adult stage. Ecologists can go out and measure some important properties of the grass population that we need to know if we want to predict how the population will change in time. For instance, they can measure the survival rate of the seedlings as they grow into vegetative adults. In a study by Van Durp et al., they found that only 6 out of 1,000 seedlings survived a year later to become a vegetative adult. So the probability of going from seedling to vegetative adult is 0 0.006. They can also track what happens to the vegetative adults. They found that a year later there was a 40% chance that the vegetative adults would still be vegetative adults, a 40% chance that they would transi transition into generative adults, and a 20% chance that they would die. Similarly, the generative adults were found to have a 40% chance of remaining generative adults and a 40% chance of phasing back into vegetative adults. Unlike the vegetative adults, however, 
the generative adults also produce 500 new seeds every year. So how do we use a function to study the potential growth of this grassland? Well, first let's define a vector p for population. Our vector is a three vector and has elements p1, p2, and p3. Let's actually rename those elements though. We will rename them s, v, and g because they represent the number of seedlings, number of vegetative adults, and the number of generative adults that are currently in the population. Okay, let's get that vector out of the way for a minute and talk about how we can actually determine how the population will change over the course of a year. We basically want to encode the probabilities of change that the ecologists figured out in the model. So let's create a matrix and we'll call it G for growth. G is a three by three matrix because there are three potential states for any grass plant both at the beginning and end of a year. It can start the year as a seedling, a vegetative adult, or a generative adult, and it can end the year as a vegetative adult or a generative adult, and if it is a generative adult, it can also produce offspring. Next, let's figure out what the entries in this matrix should be. Okay, the left column corresponds to starting the year as a seedling. If you start the year as a seedling, there is only really two possible outcomes. There's a 0.6% chance that you will grow into a vegetative adult, and there's a 99.4% chance that you'll just die. So let's fill that into our matrix. We know that there is no chance that this year's seedling will still be a seedling next year. So we put in a zero in the seedling to seedling entry. We know that there is a 0.6% chance that it will go from a seedling to a vegetative adult. So we put a 0.006 in the seedling to vegetative adult box. There is no chance that a seedling will transition to a generative adult in its first year. So we'll put a zero in the seedling to generative adult box. Next, let's fill out the vegetative adult box. We know that vegetative adults have a 40% chance of staying vegetative adults, a 40% chance of becoming generative adults, and a 20% chance of dying. Okay, so the vegetative adults can't turn back into seedlings and they can't generate new seedlings, so we're going to put a zero in the entry for vegetative adults to next year seedlings. There's a 40% chance that vegetative adults will remain vegetative adults, so we put a 0.4 in the vegetative to vegetative box. There's also a 40% chance that vegetative adults will transition into generative adults, so we have a 0.4 for the vegetative to generative entry. And finally, we have to fill out the column for the individuals who start the year as generative adults. They've got a 40% chance of staying generative adults, a 40% chance of becoming vegetative adults, and each vegetative adult will also produce 500 new seedlings. So in the entry for generative adults to next year seedlings, we put a 500 because each generative adult will produce 500 seedlings. In the box for generative adults to vegetative adults, we put a 0.4 because they have a 40% chance of reverting to vegetative adults. And in the box for generative adult to generative adult, we put a 0.4 because they have a 40% chance of remaining generative adults. Next, let's investigate how these matrices work together. We're going to multiply G times P to calculate the abundance of each type of next year grasses. If we multiply G by P, this is what we get. But let's make sure we all understand where this came from. The first entry of our new matrix is the dot product of the first row of G multiplied by p. So it is equal to 0 times s plus 0 times v plus 500 times g. This makes sense. It tells us that the amount of seedlings we have next year is 500 times the amount of generative grasses we have this year. That is, of course, what we all expected, because the only way we can get a seedling is by reproduction of the generative individuals and each generative individual produces an average of 500 seedlings. The second entry is the dot product of the second row of G multiplied by P. So it is equal to 0.006 times S 
plus 0 0.4 times v plus 0 0.4 times g. This again makes sense because it tells us that the amount of vegetative adults we'll have next year is equal to 0.6% of the current year's seedlings plus 40% of the total adults that we had this year. And finally, the third entry is the dot product of the third row of g multiplied by p, and it tells us that our generative adult population next year will be equal to 40% of our current vegetative adults plus 40% of our current generative adults. Okay, we're approaching this problem from the perspective of a restoration ecologist trying to figure out how his or her population will fare over time. So let's try playing this game with some numbers. Let's say we plant 12,500 seeds in an abandoned farm field. Our population vector will thus start off as 12,500, 0, 0. To figure out our population next year, we multiply g times p, and we find out that next year we will have no seedlings, which makes sense because we didn't have any generative adults, but we will have 75 vegetative, adu vegetative adults because 0.6% of our seedlings survive to become adults. If we want to figure out what our population will be next year, we can compute this again by plugging the new vector in for p. But really, this is going to get kind of tedious, because if we're working on landscape restoration, we want to be thinking 20, 30, 40, even 50 years into the future. So we want a more efficient way to write and compute this. And hopefully you can think of what that more efficient way is, since this, is, this lecture is about functions of matrices. So let's write this as a function. We will call our function f of x. f takes a vector x and gives an output that is equal to g times x. It therefore calculates next year's abundance of each stage of grass based on this year's grass abundance. Let's also say that we are starting off our restoration project in the year 2020 by planting 12,500 seedlings. So we will define a vector p2020 equals 12,500, 0, 0. We can then compute that p2021 equals f of p2020. And it is simple to also plug things in and calculate that the population in 2022 will still have no seedlings, but will have 30 vegetative cells and 30 generative cells. Let's think about writing this out in a different way that takes up a little bit less space. We start out with the abundance of the different stages of grass in year 2020 and we apply function f to find the abundances in 2021. We simply apply f again and we have the abundance in 2022. We apply f again and we can now see that those generative adults have started to produce new seedlings. We've got 15,000 seedlings, although our adult population has started to decline some since we haven't had time for the new generation to go, grow adults. We apply f again and we find that by 2024 our abundance of vegetative adults has really started to increase. Apply f again and we have our abundances in 2025. Apply it again and we can see that by 2026 our number of naturally produced seedlings is more than the amount of seedlings that we started with. We can easily graph this for longer periods of time if we want to see what our recovery would look like over the course of a decade. The top plot shows the abundance of seedlings, which initially dips, then starts to grow rapidly. The second and third plots show the, abundance, show the abundances of vegetative and generative adults, respectively. By the end of the decade, we have nearly a thousand total adults and are naturally producing over 90,000 seeds each year. All right, so far we've been using a fairly simpler, simple approach of applying the matrix G every time. What if we realized that our ecosystem was not actually this simple? Maybe we don't have this idealized scenario with grass growth and natural mortality. What if we were trying to recover grassland in an area where ranchers were letting their cows graze? Maybe we figured out that those herbivores were eating 30% of the adult grass every year both the vegetative and generative adults. Let's write a new function. We will call the new function h for herbivore. h of x is equal to g times x plus 0, 0, 0, 0, negative 0, 0.3, 0, 0, 0, negative 0, 0.3 times x. We still have g times x in there, 
because the grass is still growing at the same rate. However, now we have the additional matrix in there. That is one example of a diagonal matrix, and basically it codifies 30% of the vegetative adults and 30% of the generative adults dying each year. We can then do the same mathematical experiment, starting with 12,500 seedlings, and compute the amount of grass that we'll have each year. In this graph, the blue lines are the same populations that we computed last time when there were no herbivores, and the red lines are the results we get by applying function h instead of function f. We can see that our recovery is not going so well if the herbivores are eating 30% of the grass. Okay, so what could we do to try and improve our recovery? What if instead of planting seeds only once, we planted 12,500 seeds every year? Well, let's write a third function, and we'll call this new function r for replanting. r will still have g of x, and it'll still have our matrix that codifies the losses to grazers. However, it now also adds a vector 12,500, that tells us that 12,500 seeds are being planted each year. Now if we compute the changes over a decade by repeatedly applying function r, we can see by comparing the new green line to the original blue line that the ecosystem recovery is about the same if we have cows but plant 12,500 seeds every year, or if we kept the cows off the land and did not replant. This then becomes a management question. Is it better to replant continuously or to exclude the grazers? Luckily, we've given the managers some useful information on which to base their decisions. Next, let's talk about an example from my research. One of the zooplankton groups that I study is known as SELPs, which you can see in the video on the right. SELPs are gelatinous organisms but they are actually more closely related to you and I than they are to true jellyfish or to other invertebrates. They are in a group known as tunicates, which is a chordate, meaning that they do have a notochord, but that notochord has not calcified into vertebra. So we share a common ancestor with them from immediately before the first vertebrates formed. The reason that I study salps, however, is not their evolutionary history, but rather their importance in the carbon cycle today. Salps are basically vacuum cleaners in the ocean. They are barrel-shaped organisms that have muscle bands running through their body. When they compress their muscle bands, it pumps water through their body and they filter out all the prey in that water. They can feed on very small things, even bacterial-sized prey, although they themselves are typically 1 to 20 centimeters in size. This gives them a very high predator-to-prey size ratio and the ability to eat a lot of food fast. They also produce large fecal pellets that sink really fast. These fecal pellets transport a lot of carbon into the deep ocean as part of the ocean's biological pump. This carbon can be sequestered in the deep ocean for periods of centuries to millennia. Another very interesting aspect of salps is their life history. Life history refers to the sequence of events related to survival and reproduction that occur from birth through death. Salps have an interesting life history that ecologists refer to as alternation of generations. There are two forms of any species of salp. The oozoid, which is a solitary, asexual stage, and the blastozoid, which is a chain-forming sexual stage. Let's start with the solitary oozoid stage. The stage is asexual, but if we look closely inside it, we can see a tiny chain surrounding the orange gut of this individual. This chain is referred to as the stolon and is the embryonic stage of the colonial blastozoids. Once these colonial blastozoids have matured inside the solitary oozoid, the oozoid will release them into the water. The newly born chain of sexual blastozoids will rapidly start feeding, and each individual will start to grow. These chains typically have more than 100 individual zoids, each with the ability to filter large amounts of water. So these chains are really comprised of over 100 separate living organisms that all move and travel together. The fact that they all travel together also makes it easier for them to engage in sexual reproduction. If we zoom in on an individual blastozoid within the chain, we can see an embryo of the solitary oozoid stage starting to grow within one of the adult blastozoids. The oozoid will eventually be released to restart the cycle. 
This complex life cycle gives salps specific ecological advantages. Sexual reproduction during the blastozoid stage allows the genetic recombination that is so important for rapid evolution during periods of environmental change. Meanwhile, the asexually reproducing oozoid stage ensures that when the population is persisting at low, con low abundances, there are individuals that can reproduce quickly without needing to find mates. Keep in mind that this alternating generations is very different from what you may be familiar with in terms of tadpoles growing into frogs. An individual oozoid will never turn into a blastozoid. Rather, it will give birth to a chain of blastozoids with a very different morphology morphology and reproductive pattern, and the blastozoids will in turn give birth to oozoids. Each species of salps has its own morphology for blastozoids and oozoids, which led to considerable confusion amongst early salp taxonomists that did not realize that blastozoids and oozoids could be from the same species. The most important consequence of this alternation of generation strategy, however, is the potential for rapid growth and that's what we're going to use functions of matrices to study. On one of my month-long cruises, my grad students and I were in the southern ocean off of New Zealand studying salps. Because of that crazy life history I was telling you about, they have the potential for really explosive population growth rates. So that was one of the things we wanted to study on our cruise. So we collected a lot of the salps and put them in specially built tanks. We found that basically the adults of the solitary stage of the salps release chains with an average of 135 blastozoids in it. The adult blastozoids, in turn, gave birth to one single solitary oozoid at a time. So let's think about how we can use functions of matrices to compute their potential growth rates. First, we'll create a matrix called A that keeps track of the abundance of oozoids in its first element and the abundance of blastozoids in its second element. For now, we will make a couple of simplifying assumptions. We'll assume that oozoids and blastozoids grow to their adult sizes just as fast as the length of time between which adults release more babies. This is not actually true, and later for problem set number two, we'll get rid of this assumption to more accurately estimate salp growth rates. But for now, we'll make that assumption that oozoids and blastozoids grow up in the exact same length of time that passes in the duration between births of the adults. This length of time actually varies based on temperature, however. When it is warm, the salps reproduce and grow more quickly. When it is cold, they reproduce and grow slowly. So instead of writing things as a function of time, we'll write it as a function of generation. Let's create a matrix and call it R for reproduction. R will basically keep track of how many baby salps will be born each generation. Since we measured this at C, we can fill in this data. Oozoids do not give birth to other oozoids, so we can put a zero in the top left box. Each blastozoid will give birth to one oozoid, so we can put a one in the top right box that determines new next year oozoids from this year's blastozoids. Each oozoid gives birth to 135 blastozoids, so we can put a 135 in the bottom left box. And finally, blastozoids do not give birth to blastozoids, so we'll put a zero in the bottom right box. Next, let's create a third matrix, which we'll call S for survival. The matrix S will encode how many of the adults survive from one generation to the next. For now, we will assume that there is no mortality, so we'll actually make S equal to the identity matrix, or ones on the diagonal and zeros off the diagonal. All right, now that we've got these matrices, we can write a function to predict the abundance of next generation salps from the abundance of this generation, salps. We'll call this function f, and f will be a function of the population of salps in the last generation. f of p last will be equal to r times p last, because this tells us how much reproduction there will be, plus s times p last, because this tells us how many salps will survive. One property of matrix multiplication is that it is distributive. This means that if we have the matrices A plus B multiplied by C, then that is equal to the matrix A times C plus B times C, and vice versa. So in this case, we can actually rewrite our function as R plus S times P last, sorry, times A last. This simplifies it a bit, and we can actually add R and S together to get 
a nice compact function that quantifies the number of salps we'll have in the next generation from the number of salps that we had in the previous generation. In a lot of ways, this looks like a simpler version of what we had for the grassland restoration function. But now I want to do something a little bit different. I want to rewrite our function as a recursive relationship. A recursive relationship is a formula that relates the next value in a sequence to the previous value in the sequence. Basically what I'm going to do is rewrite this function in a way that actually puts the generation number as the input to the function. We can write, rewrite this equation like this. P of n equals 1, 1, 135, 1 times P of n minus 1. I've used P here to represent the population of salps. What this function is telling us is that the population of salps in generation n is equal to 1, 1, 135, 1 times the population of salps in generation n minus 1. So this is really saying the same thing as our previous equation. However, now we're able to write things as a function of the generation. This is basically a more compact form of the notation for our function, and it'll become important in a moment. But first, let's use this equation. Let's say we start off with only a single blastozoid, and we'll call it generation 0. In that case, we can say that p of 0 equals 0, 1. We can then evaluate that p of 1 equals 1, 1, 135, 1, times 0, 1, so it is equal to 1, 1. This makes sense. If you start off with one blastozoid in generation 0, then in generation 1 you'll still have that blastozoid, and that blastozoid will have given birth to one oozoid. If we continue on to generation 2, p of 2 equals 1, 1, 135, 1, times 1, 1. So it is equal to 2, 136. We can start to see that rapid population growth starting to take off. But let's go back for a moment to look at that recursive function again. So far, we've been calculating things in basically the same way that we did before. But the fact that we wrote this function in recursive format actually allows us to take advantage of some nifty tricks. First, if p of n equals 1, 1, 135, 1 times p of n minus 1, then it is also true that p of n minus 1 equals 1, 1, 135, 1 times p of n minus 2. So we could actually plug that in for p of n minus 1 in our original equation. And now we have p of n as a function of p of n minus 2. We're just multiplying that matrix 1, 1, 135, 1 twice. Of course we could do this again to calculate p of n as a function of p of n minus 3. And hopefully you'll see the pattern we are forming. So we could actually rewrite this whole thing as p of n equals the matrix 1, 1, 135, 1 raised to the nth power times p of 0, where p of 0 is our population at generation 0. Now this is actually great because it allows us to just plug this equation into a computer let the computer multiply the matrix by itself many times and calculate the population as a function of the generation. When I plug this into my computer and graph it, we can see that by generation 5, we've already got almost 100,000 blastozoids and over 10,000 oozoids. Let's try just plugging in 10 for n. p of 10 will be equal to 1, 1, 135, 1 raised to the 10th power times p of 0. If I plug this into my calculator, we get 3.6 billion oozoids and 60 billion blastozoids. Clearly, this is almost astronomical growth rates if there is no mortality. After 10 generations, we've gone from one individual to billions of individuals. But let's keep in mind that so far, we've been calculating things based on the number of generations, and that's not normally what we care about. We care about how fast they grow as a function of time, so let's go back to our function and think about how we can use our function notation to write a function that is a function of time instead of a function of generation number. Well, if you remember back to our toolbox 2.1, we can write functions of functions. So we could write another function that says n of t equals 0 0.5 times t. If we define that t is time in units of days, 
This tells us that for every day we advance half of a generation, or in other words, our generation time is two days. Since we can write functions of functions, we can now plug n of t back into our function p of n, and we will get that p of n of t equals 1, 1, 135, 1, raised to the 0 0.5 t power, all times p of 0. This now allows us to fully graph the salt population as a function of time, and see how rapidly these salt populations can form blooms if mortality is low and growth conditions are good. That's it for this toolbox. Don't forget to take the online quiz on Canvas.